Uh, thank you, Heidi, for the introduction. I uh, appreciate that, and thank you all for being here. It's certainly my pleasure to uh, spend a little bit of time with you today. And I want to thank you, thank the Canadian Club for the uh, invitation uh, to come and speak to you. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, building prosperity in Ontario, uh, building economic growth in southwestern Ontario particularly, because I believe that we can build that prosperity. And more importantly, I believe we can build prosperity that everyone shares in. There's two parts to that phrase, building prosperity that everyone can share in. What we do with the prosperity that we create, ensuring that everyone has a stake in Ontario's wealth, is important. But if we don't build that prosperity, if we don't create wealth, it won't matter. There's no doubt that southwestern Ontario is facing serious challenges, but I know that we can find success. To do it, we need to focus on what works in the real world and not rely purely on ideology and blind faith. We need to recognize that southwestern Ontario's challenges are unique and that we can't impose solutions from Toronto. And we need to focus on creating and protecting the sorts of good jobs that people can actually rely on. If people are doing well, if the everyday families of this province are doing well, then Ontario will be doing well also. Now everyone knows that these are tough times. That's not news for families in the Southwest. In fact, the headwinds of our economy that, uh, that our economy is now facing, uh, those headwinds were blowing here in Southwestern Ontario uh, far before the rest of the province was plunged into a recession. Ontario's unemployment rate has been above the national average for over five years. And communities like London have had a rate well above the Ontario average for just as long. Middle income households that were already feeling the squeeze before the recession have now simply started to fall behind. Ontarians are struggling with the highest average household debt in all of Canada. And that debt, as we all know, has actually grown over the last years. Interestingly enough, over half of Ontarians say that they would struggle to pay the bills if they missed a single paycheck. Only one in 10 people in our province feel confident that there will be more jobs available for them in their community anytime soon. Now this isn't just a problem for people who are without work. It's a problem for our entire economy. Because we have to remember that people are the economy. Because people who worry about making ends meet are not gonna be buying new homes or new cars. People who think that there are not going to be better jobs on the horizon are not going to go after job skills training programs. People who believe things that are, are not going to get better in our economy are not going to be investing in Ontario. You know, there's growing concern from economists that household debt combined with economic insecurity in and of them themselves, those two factors are actually creating a drag on the economy. If our economy is going to work, families need to be looking to the future with some confidence, some se sense of assurance. And so do our business leaders. The private sector will create jobs that put Ontarians back to work. I believe that that is absolutely true. But we need to recognize that they're facing some challenges. And we have to look carefully for the kinds of solutions that actually work in the real world the world that those businesses have to operate in. Ontario, especially southwestern Ontario, has been heavily reliant on manufacturing for decades. But global challenges have created real pressures on manufacturing throughout Europe, throughout North America, of course, throughout Ontario. Ontario faces added, added problems, though. Uh, we were talking about this at our table over lunch. We have the highest electricity rates in the entire country. So it's no wonder that manufacturing is facing some serious challenges in this province. Canadians manufacturing, uh, Canada's manufacturing industry lost 278,000 jobs from 2000 to 2007, and a further 188,000 jobs were lost in 2008 and 2009 as the recession hit. Southwestern Ontario itself lost 5,000 manufacturing jobs in one year, 
16, or sorry, 18,000 jobs over 10 years. And everybody knows what those jobs were. Those were the exact kind of jobs that actually sustained families and the kinds of jobs that fuel their economy. Jobs with pensions and benefits and wages that paid almost $25 an hour. And that's manufacturing. But our challenges aren't only in manufacturing. They're not limited to manufacturing. Last month, StatsCan report on uh, employment shows that uh, in this community alone, 1,400 professional, scientific, and technical jobs were lost, 900 warehousing and transport jobs were lost, and 800 fewer jobs were existed in the financial sector. Now, I know, and I think everybody in this room knows, that we cannot solve our economic problems overnight. But we can look at what other jurisdictions are doing successfully, we can see how they're succeeding, and compare that to where we're falling behind. Over the last decade, Ontario governments have focused efforts on improving productivity. That's, there's been a real push by Ontario governments to, uh, to improve productivity in this province. But instead of improving, productivity growth has actually slowed in Ontario, year after year. And investment as a share of GDP has declined steadily over the past decade. Now with all of that in front of us, overcoming the challenges can seem very, very daunting and even impossible to some. People can think that, but I don't think that. I don't believe that it's impossible to overcome these challenges. They don't call me the steel town scrapper for nothing. <laughs> you know, as the world changes, new Democrats have shown a real ability to confront challenges smartly, intelligently. Long-serving NDP, uh, NDP governments have a proven tra track record on economic policy around our country. In fact, New Democrats in government have a better track record of balancing the books than any other party. Now, that might be something that people in this room are not aware of. But if you look at the financial records that are held by the federal government, you will see that NDP governments have run fewer deficit budgets and have had a lower GDP to deficit ratio than, uh, than any other government. Liberal, conservative, the NDP has a better track record historically in this, in this country. So what have they done? New Democrat governments have looked successfully at their provinces and they've been able to encourage high levels of economic growth. They've been able to develop cutting edge environmental policies, build strong, well integrated healthcare systems, create good jobs and a strong social safety net while at the same time maintaining competitive tax rates. They provide strong examples of governments that focus on real, achievable goals. Now, anybody who is prepared to write off manufacturing uh, for Ontario's future, I think, is relegating us to a province that's seen its best days, and I'm certainly not a person of that opinion. Today, manufacturing has its, uh, its uh, difficulties in front of us. But it's also doing some fantastic things, and we have to, I think, acknowledge that. Manufacturing is fostering innovation in this province. It's utilizing advanced technology. It's investing in the people who make it work every day. And while some of my opponents these days, and having the conversation about, there, I use that word. <laughs> Try not to use that word. Uh, anyways, but having, uh, having discussions with, uh, with colleagues and, and others and looking at uh, what ideas are coming to the table in terms of the future of our province, some of my opponents think that the key to success for the future is driving down wages in an attempt to make us the next Alabama. I don't believe that a race to the bottom is actually a path to prosperity for the province of Ontario. I reject that premise. Look at places where they're doing things differently where they've had success, where they've weathered the financial storm, where they've weathered the economic global downturn uh, in a much more successful way. Countries like Germany. Germany's a manufacturing powerhouse, continues to be to this day, with ready markets for its high-end goods. In 2009, German, German exports totaled $1.1 trillion. That's roughly one and a quarter billion dollars more than U.S. exports in the same year. 
and their average wage in manufacturing in Germany is $12 an hour higher than the average wage in Canada. Now that's just one example. The jurisdictions that are outperforming us didn't do it by driving down wages, by closing hospitals and slashing strategic support for businesses that rely on that support to succeed. They did it by working with job creators and incentivizing job creation. They did it by ensuring that investments that led to value-added production actually was happening in those jurisdictions and here in Canada, in those provinces. And they did it by ensuring that other real costs, like affordable electricity rates, were under control and reliable health care for employees was assured. And we don't have to look across the ocean. Over the last six years, Manitoba has seen the highest increase in labour productivity in the entire country. More than double the national increase and more than double Ontario's increase. And their success was based on tax credits that tied tax relief to investments in the province. That's a real world success that we need to be looking at. Manitoba to our west, Quebec to our east are providing reliable electricity rates for businesses and their citizens at literally half the price that we're being charged here in Ontario. Now, I don't think it's a coincidence that those provinces also have publicly owned and accountable electricity corporations with a mandate to actually provide affordable power. Again, we can make real progress if we're ready to look at what works, what's already working in the real world, and think about implementing some of those solutions in our province. So while we look for new ideas, we can't, uh, we can't ignore local experience, local expertise, local knowledge. Those things are all extremely important. You can't dictate, for example, from Toronto what will and won't create success here in London. But you can ensure that business can get the supports that they need. We worked with the government very closely in the last uh, budget and actually after the last budget and over the, uh, the early part of the fall. We all know what happened in the late fall. Uh, but we worked with the government very, very closely to create the Southwestern Economic Development Fund, and I'm sure you're aware of that fund. It wasn't our legislation, but we thought it was a good idea. So we did what we had been doing since the minority government was elected, and we rolled up our sleeves and tried to, to make it work. We, uh, we got into committee and we made some amendments to that bill because we had some problems with it. But that fund is a small step to help job creators uh, and, and make sure that it's helping job creators particularly in a part of the province that's been very, very hard hit here in southwestern Ontario. Now some others thought it was more politically convenient to oppose that fund. We didn't think so. Instead we actually got to work and did our jobs and, and tried to make it a better fund. And what we did is we made it more accountable to communities like yours. We made it more transparent to the people who are paying for it. We succeeded in ensuring that the fund itself was going to be a non-partisan fund. That's one of the problems we had with the bill when it was introduced. That it was a, a fund that was going to be determined uh, solely by the government in power and not by any local voices. And, and I thought that was a big mistake. Uh, the people who prioritize the applications and where the money flows, I believed, needed to be local people. And so at committee we amended that bill. So now, the bill has been passed, it's gotten royal assent, royal assent but the problem that we have is that the, even though the fund exists, the local structures have not been put in place to, um, to let that money flow. And that's not a fault of your community. Uh, that's uh, because the government has not prioritized uh, the implementation phase of that, uh, of that legislation and those dollars flowing. And that's an issue, in fact, that uh, Teresa Armstrong has raised in the legislature as your local MPP uh, a couple of times. And, and that's what our job is. Our job is to actually try to get the results that we think are going to make a difference uh, and then and make sure we, uh, we stay on top of those files and make sure the implementation phase actually comes to fruition. Uh, we plan to keep working hard to get those kinds of results uh, that allow local leaders like yourselves to provide the support that local businesses need so that those local businesses can either start up or so that they can continue to thrive. And so I know that with the right supports, manufacturing in our province and in this part of the province 
has a very bright future. But we can't afraid, be afraid to also look at other sectors of our economy uh, for future growth as well. I got to spend a lot of time in Kitchener-Waterloo, coincidentally, over the last little while. I'm not sure if you, if you know why, but uh, I spent some time in that region over the summer. Uh, of course, lending support to a, a fantastic MPP, Catherine Fife, and her quest to, to get that job. Uh, and I got to actually get a, a front row seat during that time. Uh, it's to, to some of some of the most amazing um, minds, really, that are at work here in Ontario. I visited a place called the Accelerator Centre, which is an incubator for new high-tech uh, startup companies. And I was pretty impressed by what was happening there. It's an amazing place, and it's only one of several of those kinds of places that are uh, sitting in the uh, Kitchener-Waterloo area. Uh, one example of a company that I met and uh, was introduced to, it was a tiny handful of employees. I think there were maybe five of them. And they were creating a product that they were literally marketing worldwide. It was a high-end security software product. And they were selling it to nations around the world. And they were selling it to places like Interpol, uh, the C to CSIS. Uh, they were selling their software everywhere. And it was quite, quite impressive. These four or five very thoughtful, very creative Canadians who were tucked away in the corner of this huge facility in Waterloo had this worldwide reach. It was astounding to me. It was fantastic. You know, Canada produces about 4% of world scientific output with only half of 1% of the population. I think that's something that we can be pretty proud of. And clusters of innovation, like the high-tech sector, are prime examples of the key role that government has to play in creating these sex success stories, because that center in particular uh, was, uh, was the creation of, the result of, uh, the work of universities and government uh, and local community uh, to kind of come together, and industry, to come together and, and, and come up with a way uh, to try to capture uh, some of those great minds. And they've done a fantastic job. Do I care that it was a Liberal government that brought the Accelerator Centre in? Of course not. Do I think it's a fantastic thing uh, for the province of Ontario and for that region? Absolutely. And it's an example of the kinds of things that we can do together if we really focus our initiatives. You know, without universities, without world-class research and researchers, the innovators in uh, uh, in the world would not be con congregating at all in Canada. And we know that they are doing that because they get proper supports. And so with those kinds of supports, and that means everything from the kinds of things I've already described, but also supports like a, a health care system that's, uh, that's there for them and their families, uh, to working venture capital that they need to get their products off the ground, I'm certain, I'm absolutely sure that there are sectors of our economy that we don't even know about yet that are going to help us uh, into a healthy future. But we need to be innovative if we're going to be able to support our innovators. Ontario has lacked a coherent strategy to promote venture capital for far too long in this province. And I heard it in Kitchener-Waterloo, and I've heard it at the Mar Centre in downtown Toronto, and I've heard it in many other places in this province. And if we look to what's you know, working in other jurisdictions, we can see uh, that there are models that we can, uh, we can perhaps think about. Uh, we can see that in Quebec, for example, despite its much smaller size, uh, that province consistently provides venture capital to more companies than Ontario. Moreover, they provide more investment support to small and medium-sized startups. One startup fund in Quebec, working with investors, labour and government, uh, holds equity in some 2,100 small and medium-sized enterprises that have created and or saved over 160,000 jobs over the recessionary period. Now, from my perspective, that's an example of real-world success, of something that's actually working right now in another part of, uh, of, of the province, or another part of the country, never mind the world. Now, I know that we have some talent in this, uh, in this part of the province. I know that Southwestern Ontario is full of talented people. I'm proud to say that uh, I was talking earlier to some of the folks from uh, Fanshawe College. I'm proud to say that my son actually goes to school here in London, Ontario at uh, Fanshawe College. And his classmates and himself are developing the skills uh, that they need uh, for tomorrow. Not only that they need for tomorrow, though, but the skills that we need for tomorrow. And we owe it to them to help them find the jobs that they need to make sure that there is a tomorrow for them. 
And that's why we put forward, New Democrats, a plan to work with employers who are already, who are ready rather to put kids to work. It's a big problem, and I'm going to move away from the speech for a minute. It's something that I hear all the time. I hear it from parents. I hear it from women when I go to the Y in Hamilton. Uh, I hear it from uh, from folks at the grocery stores. People are very, very worried about their sons and daughters who are in their 20s, late teens, to early 20s. They're worried that those sons and daughters are going to be living in their basements until they're 30 years old. I'm worried about that too, I've got to tell you. I am worried about that. My son has his own man cave. That's not supposed to happen. <laughs> Anyways, uh, but it's true. And, and they're worried because they, their kids are going to college or they're going to university and they're finishing with their certificates or their degrees and they're not able to get a job. They can't get work. They can't even get part-time work in order to help themselves get through college and university. Very different uh, from when, when I was going to school, certainly, and I know very different from when some of you were going to school. It's, uh, it's a different scenario out there, and it's tough for kids. And so that's why we put forward a plan for the uh, Ontario government to consider that actually recognizes that this is a real problem and we need to see some action on it. So we've asked them to put forward uh, or to put together a plan to actually get young people connected with employers who are prepared to hire them by, by taking over or by taking responsibility for some of the wage costs. So it's a, it's a direct wage subsidy program, it is, because we think it's important that young people get that first start to employment. We think it's important to help companies uh, reach out to those young people and get them on the payroll, uh, because the young people not only need the earnings, but they need the learning. They need that on-the-job experience. So it is a jobs training program. It requires some training to take place, uh, but it also makes sure that those young folks are actually beginning to, to set up their future. Um, one, one of the things that I think is, uh, is clear about this plan, though, is that it's actually a, 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 the kind of investment uh, that we need to not only help kids, but help kickstart our economy. Um, it's, uh, it's another idea that we've had like others. I mean, we had, uh, for many years now, we've been trying to encourage the government to, uh, to put in place a job creator tax credit. We actually talked a lot about it in the last budget process. It's something that Barack Obama has put forward in the United States. And it's a, a similar idea, uh, although there's no direct subsidy, it's a, it's, a, it's a tax credit for hiring. So that employers who are uh, looking to hire people uh, will get a tax credit for, for doing that because we know uh, that it's tough to get people started up onto the payroll. It's, it's burdensome for a, a company to do that. And by giving them a tax credit for, uh, for that, we are encouraging um, you know, em employers to, to expand their workforces. We also believe that tax credits for investment are a good way to go. I talked earlier in the speech about Manitoba and the rate of investment that's happening there, productivity investment. Uh, they have a, a productivity, or rather they have a, a job creator, they have an investment tax credit system. They have refundable investment tax credits there so that companies who are investing in their local plant, in their technology, in their machinery, are actually able to, to get refundable tax credits so it's not at the end of a year, it's during the business cycle, and it helps them to actually you know, make the, take those next steps, take that little bit of risk uh, to, to grow the business. And that's something that we think would work in Ontario. We see it working in other jurisdictions. And again, it's not about whose idea it is. It's about whether or not it's actually working uh, and, and whether or not it has potential to work in our community or in our province. And I certainly do uh, believe that it does. So the bottom line is, uh, both, both the tax credits, uh, investor tax credits or investment tax credits and uh, employment tax credits or jobs tax credits as well as the, uh, the plan for young people uh, in terms of our, our first start uh, program are things that we think uh, are, would be successful because we can't continue to uh, allow doors to close for young people or for workers overall. People are becoming very, very discouraged, and I don't need to tell you that, especially in your community. And we need to find the ways to get them back to work and to feel, get them feeling confident again about the future. And it, there's no doubt it's going to cause, uh, uh, cause some, uh, some choices to be made. There's no doubt that it needs to, to it means that there's choices that have to be made. But the, the bottom line is that if we're going to make those kinds of investments that I've described, it means that we're going to have to pass on some other things that we've been doing. 
Uh, in tough economic times, I don't believe uh, that it makes sense for a tax system to reward companies that shift profits out of Ontario, for example, or start uh, offering new tax credits for companies uh, that are writing off meal expenses and entertainment expenses. That's a new credit that's coming up uh, in two years' time. For me, uh, I mean, I understand that companies want these kinds of uh, uh, extras, but let's get the basics right first. I mean, let's focus on the job creation first. Let's get people working again. That's where the choices are from my perspective. Uh, there are better ways to create jobs uh, than, than providing uh, some of the, uh, the kinds of uh, credits that have been introduced and, and used in Ontario so far. There are better ways to help businesses uh, and that help businesses in a way that help Ontarians get back to work. We can help, young, uh, help employers put young people to work instead, in, instead of helping those that are putting profits outside of Ontario. And I was interested to see the budget yesterday because the federal government's talking about uh, individuals who are sending uh, profits offshore out of, uh, out of Canada. And what we're saying is even within Canada, there's an issue of, uh, of companies and where they declare their profits. I believe that if you're making profits in Ontario, you should be paying your taxes in Ontario. I think that's just a fair way to go. Ontarians would agree with that. Uh, but there are very simple steps that we're talking about. They're, they're not uh, earth-moving changes. Uh, they're very simple steps. They are different choices, but they're steps that I believe will make real differences uh, in, the in the people of this province's uh, capacity to see a brighter future. Uh, and we expect to see some of those changes in the upcoming budget. Again, the, that's the big question on everybody's mind, what's going to be happening in the next couple of weeks uh, as a, a budget is uh, tabled in Ontario. And I can tell you my position has not changed. Uh, I have uh, I've said from day one, when we were um, faced with a minority government uh, about a year and a half ago, that I was prepared to roll up my sleeves and get work done for the people of this province. That's the job that they gave me, and that's the job that I've taken seriously. And I think that uh, last year, New Democrats were able to do some important things in the budget, uh, and I'm prepared to, to try to get them some things done this time as well. And so the Premier knows what, what the priorities are. Uh, they're about shutting corporate tax loopholes, making sure we're focusing on getting young people to work, uh, dealing with our home care system, which is, well, you have the prime example of a, a home care system that's not working right here in, in London with the, uh, the family that can't be reunified that have been married for, uh, for 70 years. I mean, that's uh, not a home care system that's working. So well, we want um, a home care, care five-day home care guarantee, uh, and we think that we can get some of, uh, uh, some of the savings that would fund that uh, through uh, just changes in the way the health care system operates right now. Uh, we want to see uh, uh, we want to see the, um, the, the the things that we've brought forward reflected in the budget. Uh, and I've said to the Premier clearly, uh, it's not a lot to ask. There are not uh, unreasonable acts, uh, asks. Uh, having people who are on social assistance and ODSP keep the first two hundred dollars of their earnings uh, every uh, every pay is or, or every month is not um, that's not unreasonable. Uh, and so. The, uh, the ball is in the Premier's court, as they say. I'm looking forward to seeing what the budget uh, looks like uh, because I think that there are some real uh, achievable things that we can do for the people of this province. And, and I've said all along, uh, I'm, for me it's about getting results. Uh, and as, I'm, uh, as I indicated in my speech, I don't care whose idea it is, if it's a idea, an idea that works, if it's something that is proven to be effective, uh, then let's think about uh, bringing it to Ontario and, and trying to get some changes here that make sense for the people. Uh, so uh, when we uh, go over the next couple of weeks, we'll see whether or not the Premier's interested in, uh, in making some of these changes, uh, and I certainly hope that she is. Uh, I don't know at this point in time, uh, but we're all, we're all going to know probably in about a month and a half. Uh, but I have to say in closing that um, I, the, there's no doubt that these are challenging times. I mean, I'm from Hamilton, just down the road, and uh, our, our community's not been hit hard quite a, not been hit quite as hard as your community, but uh, but certainly we've seen some tough times as well. But I think within these challenges, within this difficult, you know, scenario that we're facing economically, we do have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to build a better province, to confront and correct some of the mistakes that we've made in the, fa in the past, and to reject some of the old ideas that simply are not working. And you know, it's not easy to do that. It's never easy to do that. But you know, nothing worth doing is ever easy. We can reject the reckless short-term thinking and, and temporary fixes that uh, have often uh, been implemented in this province, and we can build carefully for a sustainable future. 
We can discard the politics of partisan advantage and short-term scheming and focus on the challenges that are facing people building a better world for our kids. Now, we're not going to get there, I don't believe, with the same old ide ideas and the same kind of status quo solutions. But we can get there by building the kind of prosperity that every Ontario can share in. And we can succeed if we do that, I think, in ways that we don't even know uh, that are, are cap we're capable of. And so I'm looking forward to working with people like yourselves, people all over this province, to build that shared prosperity uh, for Ontarians. Thank you very much.